Voting isn't going to the polls on election day anymore. Options like early voting, mail-in voting, and ballot drop boxes are available to more voters and are growing in popularity. How to Vote, a tool created by Democracy Works, breaks down the options your state offers for casting a ballot, empowering you to decide when and where to vote. Democracy Works is committed to helping you vote no matter what. Their tool, How to Vote, does just that. Sign up for election reminders. See what's on your ballot. Get step-by-step -step assistance requesting your mail ballot. Explore your options for returning your voted mail ballot. Check your voter registration status. Find your polling site. Make sure you have the appropriate ID. Now, decide when and where you'll vote. This is how you do it. HowToVote.com Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to bring to you Supreme! What's up everybody and welcome to another episode of the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. And this is your host, Supreme Decisions. Now, today is going to be a slightly different but not really it's going to actually be one of those where we're getting close back to the norm but it's probably going to be the first one that we're going to have that's put out on time and on schedule the reason being is because i've got an actual mini studio set up while we're actually getting the one in el paso put together and i'm going to make sure well i'm going to make the most of it so I want to make sure I put out quality content for you guys so it may sound a little different today because we're not only inside, like I said, a studio, but we're inside a enclosed building. So you may hear a little bit more echo. However, I'm hoping that the context of what I'm coming through as well as my voice is a little more clear than it usually is by being outside. Well... Today I want to talk about due process when everything is a crime. This is something I kind of touched on probably about a year ago when I first started the podcast and I talked about the fighting words doctrine. I didn't go really deep into it, but I did use that as a talking point or a step in point. And today is not going to be very much different because most of us have very little idea what due process actually is and what you know really constitutes a crime because a lot of times people still go off of their feelings on how they view a situation versus getting information and then making an informed decision about the situation now the reason why i chose due process when everything is a crime it's kind of an illustration because you and I know that a crime has to deal with someone having an injury. That can be fairly traced to the defendant's actions. That can be an action that's done through negligence. That can be an action that is done through a breach of an agreement. That can be an action that results in some type of physical contact. And even in some cases, some type of mental anguish. But the crime has to be something where there is someone that is injured from it. Now, what we have in our judicial system, it's one of those things that kind of skew the numbers. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we get to where we are right now. Our current climate in our judicial system hell in our judicial climate we have a lot of issues there are a lot of people that are going out speaking about defund the police defund the police defund the police but we're forgetting that the police is just one small cog in the machine because the most dangerous thing to actual justice is not the police it's the prosecute it's the prosecutorial discretion that poses an increasing threat on justice. Because what they're doing is picking and choosing who 
they do and do not prosecute, who they do and do not go after. Generally, the people that suffer the most from this type of selection, you know, for lack of a better word, are those that are poor and disenfranchised. And this is becoming a due process issue. Now, what happens is, when you have someone that is cherry-picking who they're going to prosecute, that borderline on malicious prosecution. But then you have things that are systemic, such as what goes on here in Harris County. And what I talked about in Harris County was the DA, and I believe her name is Kim Org or Og or whatever, however you pronounce it. And she allows her office, after using as a slogan, evidence-based justice. She allows her subordinates to not turn over evidence to the defense, to not disclose shit discovery. And then she allows, in that manner, anybody that wishes to con you know, I guess, come against them as a defense attorney to force pleas from their people, even if they are non-crimes. And then, one of the things that makes this more prevalent is the fact that this is also something I've experienced, and then it's also something that I witnessed. Now, the witnessing of this is the fact that literally in Harris County, I'm probably helping about five or six people that are going through courts or some type of issue down in Harris County. And I'm watching this happen. I'm watching this unfold. I'm listening to the stories. I'm listening to the people that are being represented by attorneys. And that's why I pointed out um, Andrew Sudlow and his law firm, Sudlow and Sudlow, because they are working directly with the prosecution. They are working to make sure that their clients are paying money to the prosecution. They are working to make sure their clients are getting pleas. Where in fact, if you look at their brochure, the one thing they point out is the fact that they will work hard to get a dismissal. But the one thing they're not doing is working hard to get a dismissal. Because at the end of the day, they understand that in order for them to keep eating, they're going to have to kind of pay the piper. It's almost like they're being pimped at some point. Because just like in my trial, there was a young man named Eric. Eric had taken a five-year plea bargain to testify against myself and two of my brothers. Well, the funny part about it was Eric got on the stand. He said a few words and when he sat down, he realized it. And I asked him, I said, so basically, you took a plea for something that was not a crime, and the court in this county that charged you with this crime, that is offering this punishment to you, doesn't even have jurisdiction over. Because you don't live here. You are not a resident of this county. You are not a resident of the state. You are not even having an issue or had an issue in this city, town, or state. But you took a deal for something. Your attorney allowed you to take this deal. But you have yourself admitted with your testimony that you didn't even commit a crime. And people were good with him doing that. Because here's, here's the thing. People are okay with the damaging of one's reputation. And I'm going to say something else. This is even so greater with that of a man. So when you are a poor man, you are more so of a target. There are things that 
you know, I say I do. I'm actually watching several women kind of being bullied throughout the system. But what I'm not watching is the fact that even while I'm watching women being bullied through the system, I'm watching and listening to a lot more men being bullied further and at a greater extent than they are the women. So please don't understand misunderstand when I say that. It's not that women are not being mistreated. It's the fact that a lot of times your guys are more so the target versus actual the lesser end of the mistreatment specter. And even so, because you look at people that are complaining about the issues of Facebook because there's this thing called um, what is that? Facebook Marketplace. Well, Facebook Marketplace, there are no real guarantees. There is no real, what is it? What's, I'm trying to think of a word for it. There's no real consequence for those that are not performing properly on Facebook Marketplace. Because there's even been a congresswoman that has even proposed legislation designed to ensure that even violating the terms on someone's website cannot be prosecuted as a crime. Why? Because they're wanting to elevate certain issues of crime. And the greatest part about that, that is, while it seems like, okay, they're trying to protect the people, what they're trying to protect the people from is the prosecutors from actually creating crimes. Because let's say there are people that are doing the right thing. The prosecutor can create something to become a crime. And in that creation, there can be other issues. Because I told you systemically, 95% of people do not fight back. So if you now have a new quote-unquote charge that can be laid upon someone, a new threat that can be fronted people with, you have a new weapon. So they're weaponizing the prosecution for revenue. And that sounds just like mob tactics. Maybe it's me, but that's exactly what they use as the word Gestapo. Because those are the type of tactics... The Gestapo gang did. But these are now the things that are being employed by our prosecutors, by our police department, by our judicial system. Because judges go along with it because they are sitting there as mediators, but most of them do not do any mediation. This is why I gave you those things that showed this is how you can hold a judge liable. This is how you hold a police officer liable. This is how you hold a prosecutor liable. These are the things that the prosecutor is liable for. Even if your defense attorney, such as Andrew Sudlow and his law firm, aren't performing properly, they have an obligation not only to you, but to their law license. Because I actually read that off. I didn't make that up. That came directly from the American Bar Association. This is their guideline. And one thing I constantly talk about, you can't, you can't go against yourself. You are your greatest enemy. And in, even in these things, most people have no clue or context of how to make this thing work properly. Now, if the prosecutor is obligated to choose his or her cases, it follows he can choose his defendant. Again, this is how 13% of a nation is painted as the most criminal because they are the most targeted and most prosecuted due to choice. Even when people hear things such as the speech that was given by Michael Bloomberg, which actually originated from Rudy Giuliani because he's the one that originated the stop and frisk in New York to deter crime, which actually increased crime charges. I'm going to say that one more time. He used it to deter crime, which actually increased crime. And then what they changed the statement from was not decreasing crime. There was a huge decrease in violent crime. Yes, I pause for dramatic effect because most of us allow those things to go by because words have power. Even the absence of words have power. And it's the most dangerous power of the prosecution that he will pick a person he thinks should get rather than pick cases that need to be prosecuted.
I'm going to say that one. You have someone that will pick who they believe should get something rather than pick a prosecution that needs to be prosecuted, which is why when I constantly say police are not designed, they are not designed to solve crimes. Why? Because prosecutors are not trained to prosecute criminals, which is why whenever they have to go to trial, they lose over 70% of the time because they're not trained. Whoops. Because that, there's another one where we're talking about training. Talk about the police aren't trained properly. Now I'm talking about the prosecutors aren't trained properly. And I'm talking about the police targeting people. Now I'm talking about the prosecutor targeting people. Sometimes these aren't words. Sometimes they're not asshole statements. Sometimes these things are the reality of the world, but it takes something to break it down to the simplest form for you to actually grasp it or understand it. Am I saying something that is untrue? Not at all. Am I saying something that is shocking your system? Quite possibly. But when you're picking the man and then searching the law books to pin some offense on him, this simple choice creates a system of non-truth. This simple choice creates the system of two out of every three times there is a decision that's being made. It is a wrong decision. This is why you have so many innocent folks that are in prisons that shouldn't be there. That's why you have such reckless behavior when you're actually doing or lack of doing an actual investigation onto solving issues that are happening, such as real crimes. This is also why people know that they can do certain things and they will get away with it. Because the greatest thing about it is that you got somebody else picking and choosing who they're going to prosecute. Now, I'm going to give you something because it actually blew my mind when I read this. Now, I had to understand this. Because one of the things that, that you know, I know it was there, but I didn't understand the application of it. Because it's something I've actually written down. It's something I've actually charged someone with. I never really pursued it because it actually rolls into something lesser. And I did that without actual understanding of it. But here's the one thing that um, I've noticed that was charged because it was just charged by the young lady that was in Central Park that had called the police, called 911, and said that this man had attacked her. Um, I guess it was Central Park Amy, and I think Amy was her actual name. And now, I think it's four or five months later, the prosecution has decided to charge her with a crime because even when I broke that video down, I spoke about how she used inflection in her voice because she was weaponizing the police against this man. And I also spoke about how she said something that had not happened. Well, I don't know if they're watching my videos or if they actually just took time to pay attention to the video. But they actually charged her with this thing called false crimes or false statements. False statements is a U.S. code, and it is a felony, and she can be sentenced to up to five years for this. Now, the reason why I brought that up is because, you remember I talked about, just a, literally a few seconds ago, the choice. The broadside of choice. Because selective prosecution is a real thing. But we also talk about issues. When you have people that are weaponizing the police to do something because they are allowing their feelings to dictate law, if there's something that they should be charged with, is there something that should be done to deter this type of behavior, it should happen. Because if you charge more people 
with the actual crime of the false statements when they are actually out here making false statements and using it against people in a means of shit. Because <laughs> we watch many, many, many videos of police interacting with someone that's a minority, someone with dark skin, someone that is literally just standing by and approaching them very aggressively, escalating a situation that where there is no call for escalation. And then it ending tragically, even when there has been no crime, there has been no resisting, there has been nothing that would call for or even show context of this. You will have a lot less of these Karens and you will have a lot less of these calls by these men that are just making up something. And... These are things that not only should we impress upon the prosecution, but we should be the ones that are also holding the prosecution accountable for the things they are not doing, as well as the things that they are doing. Why? Because that's our responsibility to do. I'm going to say that one more time. Because that's our responsibility to do. Because when I talk about the attack of the prosecutor. It's literally because we're allowing them to run rimshot over everything and everybody because we are not questioning or holding them responsible for their actions. But they in turn have no issue saying we did something that they know in their hearts and minds and hell, half time on video that we didn't do and then requiring us to play a penalty for it. I'm going to say that they have no issues, no qualms in standing someone beside us, having us to be punished for something they know we didn't do, and they're okay with that. And we have no qualms accepting it for just what it is and saying, you know what, maybe I should go to jail. I don't like being free anyway. And then we just let them go about their business because we listen to them say, you can't hold me accountable. You can't hold me accountable. You can't hold me accountable. Now, here's my thing. If you're a servant of the people, why is the people that's the master can't hold you accountable for your actions of not supporting the people? I'm going to say that one more time because, yes, I pause for dramatic effect because I want you to understand it. I want you to think about that. If you're serving me, my waiter comes to my table, hands me a ribeye, and I order the T-bone. Why am I supposed to eat that ribeye? Just because it's a steak? No, I want what I ordered. Because if I'm going to hold that $9 an hour waiter responsible for giving me the correct order, why can't I hold that prosecutor? Why can't I hold that police officer? Why can't I hold that district attorney? Why can't I hold that judge? Because again, all these people are supposed to be servicing me for my best interest. If they are not doing that, why am I not holding them accountable for not doing that? Yeah, I had to pause again for a dramatic effect because most of us don't even think about that. I can put up a thousand videos. There'll be people that are still asking me questions about the other 999 videos. Because at the end of the day, a lot of us don't want to go through the pain. A lot of us do not. Because, you know, I get it. I, and I get it. Let me stop before I get too deep. But, but, but I get it. Because somebody's got to make the fries. Everybody's not built like a warrior. Everybody's not built to fight. And every fighter isn't built to succeed in fighting. I'm going to say that one more time. Everybody isn't built to fight. And every fighter isn't built to win. So there are going to be, they always say, well, there's somebody that knows something more than you that knows something. That's great. There's going to always be somebody that knows something more. Here's the difference. Will there always be somebody that can execute better? Because I don't care what you know. If I can out-execute you, what you know means nothing. Because I'm going to say that there's a lot of more 
there's a lot of players out there that are probably better than LeBron. The problem is LeBron understands how to execute with those that are around him. LeBron understands how to put people around him and create a situation for them to be better as well as him. Because at the end of the day, if I can out execute you, because I I'm sitting down reading, watching tape now. When I'm sitting up here and I'm studying, because that's what I do. Whenever I get someone's case, I go through their case file. But guess what I also do? I go through my case file. I look for starting points. Because I look at each one of the cases that I have and I look at them as footnotes. Because there are certain other aspects that I have to study. And if you haven't noticed, anytime you go to a place like um, Colonial Law Review, Cornell Law Review, Harvard Law Review, um, Princeton Law Journal, they always have several other cases that intertwine. Because remember I told you, law is situational, not subjective. Because when you're building your case, you're building it around a situation. That's why you have cases that are similar but not the same. There may be several similarities that can be used from one context. But there can also be several differences in the situation that change the application of how you're looking at those similarities. Because just because one goes here doesn't mean two goes there. This is part of the new math for those that don't understand. Now I want you to understand. There are limitations on prosecutorial power. And those limitations are likely to be least effective where prosecutors act inappropriately because of political or pre uh, politics or prejudice. Because a lot of times we'll run into that political issue. Because we'll have those things that poke their head out through, you know, hell, public passions, at, just like at this time. Just like I told everybody, if you were ever going to sue a cop, now's that time. If you were ever unsuccessful at suing a cop, now's that time. Because the microscope is on them. Because here's the thing. If it's not filed prior to the upcoming election, there's a good chance you're not going to get what you want. I'm going to say that now. Because everybody, if you actually look, whenever somebody hollered, defund the police, defund the police, defund the police. And then you like, even in Minnesota, they were like, yeah, we're going to defund the police. We're going to defund the police. We're going to defund the police. And then... When it was time to defund the police, they put that meeting off. When it was time to talk about restructuring the police, they put that meeting off. Even in Louisiana, same thing. Defund the police, defund the police, defund the police. And then it was time to have a conversation about reforming, restructuring. I wish I had the cricket sound. Because I'd have dropped them right then. Because they postponed that meeting. Because right now, everybody is holding their breath. They're waiting to see. Because of political views, politics, and they're hoping that the public passion dies down. And that's what's happening. Because this is becoming less and less pronounced than it was at the beginning of the year. It's becoming less and less, I guess, criminal than it was at the beginning of the year. Because if you also look at it, while this is, they're on a the pace for 2015 of unarmed citizen murders, we're not seeing it. We're not hearing about it. Because even when a lot of people was talking about George Floyd, people didn't hear about Michael Ramos. They didn't hear about the other young lady that was pregnant in Texas that was shot by a police officer with her hands up. There were several other instances that was happening throughout the country. There was a young man in L.A. who was handcuffed, not resisting, and who was beat profusely in L.A. with no recourse. And even several other instances caught on video, nobody talked about. They're not newsworthy. They made World Star, but they did not make CNN. They didn't make Fox News. You know what did? What the president said the other day. 
how we got coronavirus. Nobody's talking about people being gunned down in front of their homes by police with their hands up. Because they have to change the narrative now. But at the same time, they're sneaking in court appearances. But then they're saying, all right, well, you don't have to come. We're going to do it on Zoom. But then while you're doing it on Zoom, they're still charging you with a crime. And at the end of the day, here's the great kicker. You have to bear the cost of this type of defense. Because nobody cares about what it is that you're doing or how you've done it. And most of us, since we're not fighting back, we're just accepting it. Because even those that contact me, y'all don't get my help for free. I'm not doing this just to be sitting out here and say, hey, you want free? That's what the YouTube is for. You want free? That's what you get to listen to me for an hour, hour and a half, a couple of cases, two hours. That's free. But to get me on the phone, you gotta gotta hit the Cash App. You gotta hit PayPal, Venmo, something. Because understanding my worth, understanding the value of this, because I ask people, how much is your liberty worth? Because there's no need in getting down to the nitty gritty about anything else. How much is your liberty worth to you? Now, I understand, I'm not here to put anybody in the poor house and tell you, oh, I need uh, $10,000 up front and then another 10000 on this. No, I'm good. I'm going to give you a number that I decide to help you with, and then we're going to run from there. If you choose to use it the way I give it to you, that's great. If you don't, that's on you. But again, it's still not free. My conversation is not free. And I hate to say it because I sound like an old prostitute, but that's what it is. At the end of the day, you have to bear the cost of your defense just because there's an accusation out there. Now, my question to you, why isn't there an opportunity for you to show some recourse for accountability? Because whether you like it or not, that actually is something that deters you from fighting. This is also something that deters you from saying something to your defense counsel. Because... A lot of times, when, even when I say it, and it cracked me up because I'm reading it, but I'm saying something different. And I tell people this all the time. We talk about ineffectiveness of counsel. The actual statute is ineffective assistance of counsel. Why? Because the counsel is your employee. You are the boss. So it's not an ineffective of counsel. It's ineffective assistance of counsel because you have to assist them in your own defense you have to hold them accountable for your defense you have to make determinations about your defense which is why they then have a liability to you uh oh I think I just said I think I said something you know, you can stop me if you want to, but I think I just said something because most of us don't even think of it that way. Because we're listening to them because when I talked about woe to ye lawyers, that's the one thing we expect. We expect them to be honest. We're expecting them to go against their friends. We're expecting them to actually be on our team because we gave them money. That's the mistake that all of us make. Because they are the keepers of knowledge. If you also remember, they're also the hindrance of those that are innocent. They hinder those that come to them. Now, this is going to be the first stop for the commercials today. Because we do have several important ones. I want you to take a listen to them. And this is just a, actually I think this is the second one. And we're going to have one more after this. But I want you to pay attention. I want you to understand where it is I'm coming from. I want you to listen to where we're going. And I want you to understand how to apply what it is that you need to apply to get to a better place. Because 
until that's done, you're going to have an issue. Until that's done, you're going to be left to somebody else's devices. This is one way that we start to reclaim who we are. So, get ready to go to that commercial. I'll talk to you guys in just a second. Even though this is a presidential election, there are many more candidates on the ballot besides the president. Go to Ballot Ready for a nonpartisan guide to your entire ballot. From there, you can compare candidates based on stance on issues, biography, or endorsements, and then save your choice to use when you vote by mail or in the voting booth. You can even request an absentee ballot or make a plan to vote early or on an election day. This election matters. Make sure you have a plan to vote and vote informed. 30% of voters take the time to vote and then leave some part of their ballots blank. This is a mistake. This is a missed opportunity to choose the leaders of your communities. Go to BallotReady.org and enter your address and make a plan to vote and vote informed. All right, people, welcome back. Now, one of the things that I talked about just before we left was the, hell, the requirement to bear the cost of your own defense. And we also talked about only um, 5% of people fighting back. So that means when you're bearing the cost of your own defense, you're going to face a strong pressure to accept a plea bargain. And that is generally how the prosecution pretty much gets the upper hand. That's why they win so much. Is because that generally, when you have to pay for something, you pay more attention to it. So a lot of times those words have a hell of a lot more power than maybe they should have. And even in those situations, we have to understand what's real and what's not. And then when you have what they consider the worst case of the modern tendency of prosecutors to overcharge with extensive kitchen sink indictments. Now, what that entails is you have the old adage of what they did to several people. And we're actually going to include uh, myself in that. We were charged with almost 108 counts in total. Now, the two main charges were racketeering and conspiracy to commit racketeering which is you only need one of them the problem is there is no definitive term for which one they can charge because technically when you're talking about rico there are several things that lie under it but when you have something that most people don't understand is the conspiracy or the attempt well, the one thing I do understand is intention. Men's rea. The guilty mind. Because intent is involved in every crime. Because one has to have an intention to commit a crime in order for it to be a crime. Which is why even things that fall under the guise of negligence is often dismissed as an accident. That's why they literally have those. Because if there's something that happens, there is damage to a personal property. There are those things where they're just beyond your control. So it is called an accident, not a crime. Well, the problem is people are being charged as criminals for accidents. Because... All the prosecutor needs is one. They can charge you with a hundred things, literally. They don't need the verdict from 12 people on one. And then you have to understand that you got 12 people sitting up there looking at you that don't know you, don't give a shit about you, angry that they're there. They don't want to be there. And then they're being told that you're guilty. That's why whenever I talk about certain things, and I talk about keeping the focus, you want to make sure that they're not looking at you. They're looking at someone else. 
That's why one of my favorite shows is How to Get Away with Murder. Because the first thing she talks about is introducing a new suspect. Well, that introduction is easy. You have to give these people someone to not like. That's not you. I'm going to say that one more time. You're going to have to give the jury someone to not like. That's not you. They don't have to like you. They just have to dislike someone else. Because you only need one juror. They need all 12. Which is why they're not trained to win. They're trained to do tactics. Because you have to bear the cost of your defense. To pressure you into accepting a plea bargain. See how we just talked about that? So what happens if you're poor? What happens if you don't have any money? That means you can't make bail. So that means you're sitting waiting on trial. Which means you're hoping that someone's working on your behalf. But most of you know you, there's not. You're hoping that once you make bail, that then you can file motions to get your speedy trial and all that good stuff. But then what happens is you allow them to say something to you and then you get frustrated. Why? Because you don't understand the procedures that are going forth for you. I'm going to say that one more time. Because you allow those procedures to go forward for you. And most people don't understand why. They don't understand why these things are happening. Why these things are now becoming in your face and becoming more painful for the most part. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing What's being said, what's being shown, what's being illustrated is something simple. It's the old adage of, are you willing to stand? What's going to cost you more? Are you willing to take the simple, easy, right now route? Or are you going to build something for the future? Because here's the thing. When I talk about reputational damages, it can be great on its importance simply because the impact can be long term that's why you hear a lot of these hollywood types and they'll go oh well you it was accused of something i think me personally this is where the belief comes in there's no fact in this but i feel if you settle once you'll settle again my thing is if someone is saying you did something, you have to fight it. Plain and simple. If you're in a courtroom and they had the gall to bring it to a courtroom, you fight back. That's it. You don't. But you also do it with a vigor that's second to none. You have to do it with a certain blindness. You have to do it what C.T. Fletcher referred to as an obsession. You have to attack it obsessively. It has to be what you wake up to. It has to be what you go to sleep to. It also has to be the reason you're not sleeping. And it generally has to be the reason why you're wide awake. Because at the end of the day, until you fight back, you're going to continue having those problems. And just like I tell people, the greatest thing that was given to me was the understanding that the better I got at what I was doing, our very strength invited challenge. That's something that was brought up in a in a Marvel movie. The stronger you are, the greater those challenges are going to be because it's getting you to the next level. That's one of the things that most people cannot fathom. They can't grow to the context of even understanding that. And the prosecutors count on the fact that when the defendant faces a hundred felony charges, the prospect that a jury might go along with even one of them will be enough to make a plea deal look attractive. Notice there is nowhere in there a prosecutor is looking for the truth. The prosecutor isn't even looking for a crime. The prosecutor is looking for a conviction because the prosecutor only cares about revenue generation. But 
we're talking about defunding only one part of the judicial system. See how they take your focus away from the issues? See how whenever I start talking about the things that are actually documented, that's actually written down, now it sounds different. I sound funny even saying it. Because now we're putting it into a real context. And prosecutors have no countervailing incentives not to overcharge. Why? Because only 5% of people fight back. Their goal is to get a plea. Their goal is to get the W. And here's the greater part about that. There's no team in sports history that has gone 95%. And won it. I'm going to say that one more time. Because the Patriots. They won 95% of their games. They went 18-1. and won. The Dolphins that went undefeated. They only played 16 games. You look at the greatest NBA team. And. Yeah. They lost 9 games. And didn't win the championship. You look at the greatest NBA team. That did win it. They won 88% of their games in the playoffs. And that's the Los Angeles Lakers with Kobe and Shaq. But when you're getting a 95% conviction rate. How are they losing that 5%? I want you to think about that. How are they losing the 5%? Oh, those are the people that are going to trial. Those are the people that are going to trial. Why? Because 95% of people fight nothing. They just accept the, fee, the plea because they bear the cost of the defense. And they do not give a damn about the long-term repercussions of their reputational damage that has been inflicted upon them. Because here's, here's the thing. Here's where we make the difference, and this is also one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast, because it's before the election. State prosecutors are often elected and subject to direct political constraints. That means these bastards are voted in. You're making a choice on them. Because at the federal level, prosecutors are subjected by and supervised by the attorney general or the president who must take account to public reaction. Now, to give you a little bit of context, in the Breonna Taylor case, the one thing everybody got pissed off was the fact that the Attorney General, yeah, we we, we just said that, the Attorney General, because the federal prosecutors are subject, okay, yeah, their supervisor, the Attorney General, he actually intervened in a state grand jury. Whoops. The state Attorney General intervene in a state-level grand jury proceeding. Why is he there? That's the first question. But then two, why would a federal court officer be involved in a state grand jury unless there was a federal issue at question? Sometimes when you look at these things, You have to understand the whole context of it. So now, if there was a federal issue that was involved, what would that federal issue be? Oh, because you remember I told you about the oath violation as a federal crime. You remember when I told you about how they lied in a document that's a federal crime? (gasps) False statements. Most of the people had that just blow over their head. Because they don't understand the context of things that were going on. These are things that I'm putting in videos that most people are not grasping on. These are things that I'm going to be teaching in my master class. But these are also the things that people are going to let slide by the wayside. Why? Because they do not want to have the responsibility of being liable for themselves. Because here's T. You're going to see people that are going to be commenting on videos. You're going to see certain designs by their name. 
That's because they're a part of the members. You're going to see certain people that are in the chat. They're going to have certain designs by their name. Because they want more than what's being given on YouTube. They want to go to that next level. They want to understand the little nuances of understanding what the difference is at state and federal level. Because holding someone responsible that's elected, there's a process to it. But holding someone responsible and understanding who their supervisor is, is going to talk to their parents. Who do you notify? Why do you notify them? What's the reason for them to be in certain areas? What happened? These are the ways we have to make an informed decision. Because if I tell you all of them have to follow federal law, and then you see a federal law officer in a state court proceeding, you have to figure out which federal law was broken. Then you understand the context of, oh damn, that is federal. What he did do was violate a federal law. What happened here is something that should never happen. Because... He should be trained to not do that. Because we should know better. As a collective, we should know better. And even in those days, the Breonna Taylor case, multiple other cops not being indicted by or found guilty in a federal court for department violations, but also... They're all civilly liable to the family, which is why you saw a $12 million payout for Breonna Taylor's um, family, which is why, which is wrongful death, which is why um, her boyfriend, I believe it was Kenneth Walker, who received $2 million because they weren't married. But at the end of the day, had they been married, he would have gotten more money. But you also need to think about the context of the political pressure that was set out. This was less than six months. I spoke about this on my prior podcast. So, when you talk about a decision to charge a person criminally, should itself undergo some degree of due process scrutiny. The problem is, when you leave it up to someone to choose, who's supervising the chooser? Why is there an even choice? Because here's the thing. If it's not a crime, why is there a choice? Because again, a non-crime is wasting tax dollars. A non-crime is why they are able to win during jury trials, which is why you should fight. Because the people that are fighting are winning. Those that are not fighting are becoming frustrated, and they're probably the ones that are not listening very well. And they're damn sure not on my page. So, it is what it is. But this is what the outcry for change is the targeting. It's not only police that need that change. Because again, you have police officers that are being told to target the poor. You have prosecutors that are being told to prosecute the poor. Because now we have those pay-for-stay prisons. We have those, we're going to be in here and fill these prisons because they're privatizing criminal actions they're criminalizing everything they're overstepping due process and they're wanting to do away with vigorous defense so whenever somebody says oh we have a school to jail system where were they lying at shout out to Jaden Smith but also at the same time, why are we not hearing something different in the law books? And keep in mind, most of the stuff I'm reading to you or getting my notes from are from the 40s, 50s, 60s. So they're at least 60, 70, 80 years ago that we're having this same conversation. The only difference is it's more prevalent now because we're more attentive to it now our attention is here what are you going to do about it because even in the context of the grand jury it was seen as a major bar to prosecutorial, prosecutorial overreaching 
the problem is the grand jury itself is nothing but a rebuttable presumption. Because even the old aphorism is that a good prosecutor can persuade a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. That's why we're so surprised whenever they can't indict a police officer that's on video violating law. Like someone that's actually committing a crime, but it's done through choice. If I can indict a ham sandwich, but I cannot indict a police officer that's on video violating law, am I really attempting to indict the police officer that's on video violating law? No. Because even in our case, most people didn't know. We were literally indicted multiple times. Like several layers of indictments. But the funny part about it was the difficult part that they were having getting us indicted with 15 strangers. It took multiple grand juries to indict us on even Rico. And they still was not very successful at doing it. They had to do that show, that song, and dance several times because when you're looking for a crime, you got to convince 12 or 15 people. Even if you're doing it, sometimes you have that thinker that says, hold on, that doesn't make sense. I'm not just going to take your word for it. Because 2 plus 2 has to equal 4. Because that's what I've been taught my entire life. Because if I have $2, somebody give me $2, guess what? I can get something that's three ninety nine, dollars long as I don't have to pay any tax. See how I threw that in there? Because three ninety nine. dollars Anyway, grand jurors are not constitutionally guaranteed at the state level. Now, why is that important? Why is a grand jury that's being convened, such as in the Breonna Taylor case, not constitutionally guaranteed at the state level? Because at the state level, they're not looking for crimes. That's why often you don't have them reading your Miranda rights. That's why they're not telling you. You have the right to remain silent prior to your arrest. Uh-oh, I think I said something. Somebody, somebody heard me because I had to say that for somebody. That wasn't for me. That was for somebody. And most people don't even understand the context of a grand jury. The reason why a defendant does not have to speak at a grand jury because it doesn't matter. And a grand jury itself means nothing. Because it's one-sided and they don't have to present evidence. They only offer ideas. I'm going to say that it's one-sided because the defendant does not have to testify. And here's the one thing about it. Because you're not the one to have to prove anything. And getting an indictment dismissed means nothing. Because at the state level, grand juries are not constitutionally guaranteed. So if you have something where they can just charge you reckless, with reckless abandon, there's no guarantees to it. And it's one-sided. And they don't have to present any evidence. They just have to get 15 people to go with an idea. Remember the ham sandwich? The idea that the ham sandwich committed a crime. The feelings that a ham sandwich committed a crime. That's all. That's all they need. And even if you do get over there to convince them, how many times they get a child opportunity to do that? Because at the state level, there are no guarantees. At the state level, the grand jury is not constitutionally guaranteed. At the state level, there are no guarantees. At the state level, there are no guarantees. Because when you're talking to a child about a child, you should not expect any order to change. Because we're talking about two facets of this system that's broken. We're talking about two facets of the machine that are broken. But we're trying to deal with the broken pieces with the broken pieces. And the more I give you this information, the more I show you this information, the more I tell you about this information, the more it's overlooked. Because 
you still want to fight in a state court. You still want to talk to children about other children. And then expect to change. Because whenever I, I said the one thing that I learned early in my little career of fighting back was nobody wants to go to federal court. You know why? Because don't nobody want to deal with anybody else's parents. Because there was one time where I was actually dealing with a cop and he got upset and I told him, I said, be quiet. Because the adults are speaking now. I meant that just the way I said that because, again, we're at a point where I've already talked to you. We couldn't, we couldn't have a conversation because, one, the intellectual level isn't there. It was literally an adult speaking to a child. So I, as a child, he spoke as a child. So I left a child in a child's place. You have to understand what it is that's sitting before you. You have to recognize what it is that's sitting right in front of you. Because until that happens, you're not going to be able to function or even be happy at where you're at. You're not going to be able to press forward until you be able to see what it is that you are capable of. And most of the people that I deal with, the one thing I learned was who my father is. Yeah, I left that for dramatic effect because I want you to understand something. I'm not talking about the man that shot the sperm and did all that. Yeah, I'm talking about I understand who my father is. I'm going to let that marinate for a little while because a few of y'all are going to figure it out later. But most of y'all are going to be just kind of lost in the wind because I want you to understand I know who I am because I know who my father is. I understand my place because I understand where I came from. And when I, went, as a child, I behaved as a child. As an adult, I behaved as an adult and I put childish things away. I don't deal with nobody else's child. We go and talk to the parents. Because if I have an issue with a child, I'm going to go talk to that child's parents. And at the end of the day, I don't negotiate with terrorists. Have you ever tried to speak to a child, especially that don't belong to you? I don't negotiate with terrorists. So I'm going to go ahead and talk to their parents. Because... The adults should be able to work it out. Whatever the situation is, it should be able to work it out by adults. I can't deal with most of these low IQ police officers. Now, not all of them are on the bottom end of the spectrum, but there's a good plenty of them. And I do mean the way I just said that. Because at the end of the day, you have to understand what it is that's standing in front of you. You have to be able to decipher and be able to move forward and move beyond. Where it is that you're currently at. And here's the here's as I go on. The problem stems from a dynamic. In which those charges with crimes have a lot of risk. And I actually should have used the word perceived risk. Because most of us listen to the words of people that have no good intentions for us. So when they're telling us something. We believe them. And we're inclined to believe them because of false expectations appearing real. Because of the programming that's been set out in front of us. And it's because we're told that we can't do something. And we accept it because we've had an experience where we weren't able to do something. And here's the, here's, here's the great part about that. The great lie is prosecutorial immunity. Remember, because we also had the great law of qualified immunity. And the reason why qualified immunity is so strong because most people are not willing to accept that you sue a police officer in their individual capacity. I've given you case law on it. I've shown you case law on it. Hell, I even read case law on that. And guess what? Somebody will call me next week and say, well, I tried to sue them in, a, in their official capacity. In the 1983, and I have no idea why they threw my case out. Because the officer did this. And then they'll be upset with the judicial system. When in fact, it's the loose screw between the computer and the floor. That's the problem. Because they've gotten too old to learn. Because they don't want to listen to anybody that has done it. Or, they want me to do it for free. Which is good luck with that. That's all you got under good luck with that. And 
the absolute immunity of prosecutors, like the absolute immunity of judges, is a judicial invention. Because I've actually shown you how to do that the proper way. Because if you believe that the prosecutor has absolute immunity, if you believe a judge has absolute immunity, remember these are both servants of the people. The judge is serving for the best interest of the people. The prosecutor is serving the best interests of the people. How come they do not have to be accountable to the people? They're elected by the people, but they have no accountability to the people. I want you to make sense of that. I want you to listen to it, write it down, smack it up, flip it, rub it down, do what you need to do. But here are the, the things that I actually offer you. Because you hear me use the words or even phrases of harmless error, good faith, clean hands. They use these words to actually say judicial immunity, prosecutorial immunity, because they're weaponizing these words, because words have power. They're weaponizing these words, harmless error, good faith, clean hands. They're weaponizing them against you. They're judicial inventions. When you eliminate their major avenue for accountability, you offer them the ability of no scrutiny for their choices. You offer them the ability to have the rod spared. Because if you <laughs> spare the rod, you spoil the child. But the one thing that I'm doing now, because when you're writing up complaints, when you're doing your research, you weaponize those very same words against them because you can't argue with yourself. You can illustrate how they don't fall under, their actions didn't fall under, harmless error. You speak about how they were not acting in good faith by choosing you. They did not behave with clean hands because they didn't turn over evidence. They didn't offer discovery. They withheld. You know what? Y'all not listening to me. That's, that's, that's why this is fun sometimes. Because I understand what it is that's in front of me. I understand that even if I go into any case, I'm going to be dealing with this at some point. And it's like I say it over and over and over and over and over again. But it's like I'm saying it and it's futile. It just, it, it just is what it is sometimes. And when you're dealing with them. And you're laying off in a grand jury. I've actually spoken about how police officers are not intelligent enough to determine what probable cause is. I spoke about how you hold a judge liable for signing off on something that's incomplete in a warrant application from a police officer that's not doing that. And now I'm speaking about a grand jury where they're being presented nothing more than an idea. And if you're being presented with nothing more than an idea, how are you really making a probable cause determination? How are you creating something other than than a rebuttable presumption. Because at best. What you're doing is setting up. A guess. And even in Terry v. Ohio. Guessing is not allowed. Because remember I told you. I've said it a thousand times. Probable cause is tangible. Ideas. Are nothing more. Than something. That's in one's head. So now we're getting ready to go into this last commercial. 
and then I'm going to finish off the podcast for the day. Now, I want you guys to think about something. If I can only express an idea to you, can you touch it? That's all we got for right now. I'll catch you on the other side of this commercial. Are you registered to vote? Head Count is a nonpartisan organization that works with the music and entertainment industry to get fans to vote. To update or check your voter registration status, go to headcount.org, where you'll find all the information you'll need to be ready for Election Day. Are you registered to vote at your current address? More than 6% of all eligible voters have been asked to register. Headcount.org is working to change that. At headcount.org, you can also check your registration status. Millions of people get purged from the voters roll every year. Everyone should check their registration status every year. The deadline to register to vote in some states is as early as October 4th, so you can check before then. Register to vote at headcount.org. Well, all right, everybody, welcome back. And this is actually the last leg of the conversation. I actually like to look at this as an open conversation that I'm having with you guys because that's generally what I'm doing. I'm not talking at you. I'm talking to you because just like my little slogan is, I don't want you to hear me. I want to be listened to. And I think in this, this is something that's important enough for you to listen. Now, in conclusion, today, the cherry picking of selective prosecution, that's pretty much what it is. And the understanding of how the systemic judicial system has placed upon the poor and disenfranchised, the imbalance of justice, the lack of training for justice, the lack of understanding of actual legalities, and the avoidance of federal court should be something that catches everybody's attention. Something because the simple facts are nobody wants to go to federal court. Nobody. And even these indictments, you shouldn't look at them as a death sentence. It's just another form in which you have an opportunity to attack and defend yourself with and from. The easy on this is you determine how much justice you're looking for. Because just imagine... You look at someone that was in the Turner v. Driver case. How did that become a Supreme Court case if he decided that, you know what, I've got turned away once, I've got turned away twice, I couldn't get the remedy in state court. What if he had just left it alone? We then don't have Turner v. Driver in civil in Supreme Courts. Because it wasn't that he was looking for money, he was looking for justice. He was looking for accountability. He was looking to enforce law. He was making sure that not only him, but others that followed behind him, not, you know, directly behind him, like, hey, we're going to fight behind Trump. But no, we're actually, or Turner, but we're actually, he set up so he, you can actually do it whether you know him or not, whether you understand him or not. And just like we talked about the window tent, I literally did a case where it went to the Supreme Court. Not because this guy wanted money, but it's because you can understand that tinted windows is not a crime. It's a safety issue. But someone's misguided judgment doesn't make a stop lawful. Does not make a citation lawful. Does not make... A pat down, a non-search. 
there are still aspects of every criminal act that needs to be followed upon not only by the criminals, but by those that are enforcing law. And the problem is most don't understand what law is to enforce it. Because even when you look at that you don't have any um, constitutional guarantees at the state level, why is it when we're fighting and we see we don't have any constitutional guarantees at the state level for something as simple as an indictment? Why would we expect something more at the state level when we're having federal issues? If I'm having a federal issue, why am I going to state court when there's a federal court available? Why am I avoiding my house? Sometimes you need that pause for dramatic effect because if you're listening to me, not hearing me, but you're listening to me, I'm giving you an opportunity to think. To think about not only what I'm saying, but think about how it's relating to you. How does this affect you? Where do you come in on this? And, you know, I actually been doing a lot of reading and I haven't given you guys a Supreme Court case that actually means anything. But, I'll give you, I'll give you one. And United States v. Cox. And it's a 1965 case in the Fifth Circuit. The constitutional requirement of an indictment has for its primary purpose the protection of the individual from a jeopardy except on a finding of probable cause by a group of his fellow citizens and is designed to afford a safeguard against oppressive actions of the prosecutor or a court. Now, I want you to understand the separations in United States v. Cox. Because I'm not sure if you understand what the word except means. But I said earlier where an indictment does not have to show probable cause. An indictment is only a presentment that shows you have something to rebut. But if I'm using the word except on a finding of probable cause, that means the non-constitutional guarantee at state level means they don't need probable cause to indict you. It means that they are weaponizing the grand jury against you. So it's no longer a safeguard against oppressive actions because the very indictment with no constitutional guarantees is the oppressive action. It's the oppressive action of the prosecutor. So when I'm talking about attack of the prosecutor and I'm talking about the choice of the prosecutor and I'm talking about the simple facts that 95% of people go along with the prosecution even though they aren't guilty because they're the ones bearing the cost. They're accepting the reputational damage. Doesn't change that these actions are what they are. And this is a case from 1965. Because Oppression and oppressive action is a weapon. The lack of turning over disclosure is a weapon. Because just like I said, everything in disclosure is a bullet in the chamber. Why? Because you're adding ammunition to your weapon. When you're weaponizing your prosecution. When you're weaponizing Discovery when you're weaponizing evidence, you have no intention of actually finding the truth, you have no intention of working for the people, and then you'll tell me a lie that you have immunity when, if you're serving the people, you only have the immunity I allot you because I am a person. 
This is why when we have these conversations, I leave room for thought. I leave room for those to understand. You want, <laughs> you know, to see as I see, to feel as I feel, because the aggravation that comes from this, the desire to want better should not be criminalized. It should not be the option of someone else to determine what it is that you're supposed to have because of their idea of what you should have when they are in service to you. I'm going to say that the idea of someone telling you what you should have because of what they feel you should have. Because they are in service to you. Is the most backwards thing I've ever heard in my life. The one thing I want to leave you guys with today. Because I, you know this, the tail end is going to be short. Because it is what it is. Is I want to leave you guys with the thought. And the thought today is responsibility. Accepting the responsibility of what happens to you. Don't allow somebody else's choice to go into and be your normal. Somebody else's ideas for you. Somebody else's Look of, you know what? You should have this. You accept responsibility for you. And you press forward for you. And you weaponize those exact things that are against you. And use those weapons for your benefit. Love you guys. Don't forget to support the podcast. Join the website. Grab your t-shirts. Hoodies are dropping in a couple weeks. Let's keep going. Let's keep growing. Supreme, out.